Good evening. It's uh, quite late, and I am rebroadcasting tonight's Facebook Live Sermon on the Mount lesson or part nine, which is an expository teaching of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Today we're going to be spending time on being the light, being salt and light. Have to apologize. We did broadcast this a couple of hours ago, at least we thought we did. However, the adversary apparently didn't want this to go out live. I don't know why, but I reset everything, and uh, hopefully we'll, we will get started. Okay, as I said, this is the Sermon on the Mount, lesson or part number five, message number five. It is an expository teaching of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Be the salt and be the light. Welcome. Okay, well, before I get started, let me make a note. Let me explain. All of the Old Testament scriptures which are going to be quoted are from the Jewish Publication Society of 1917 version of the Bible. That's Old Testament. It's one of my two uh, most favorite Bible translations, that and the Isaac Leeser of 1853, because they translate the Hebrew, Masoretic Hebrew, directly into English. Now, since they're done by rabbis or rabbinical organizations, you do need to be cautious about some of the messianic prophecies and make sure that they are doing it correctly because they're going to be making some changes because they don't want Jews to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, all of the New Testament scripture, which I'm going to be quoting, unless otherwise indicated, comes from the King James Version of 1769. Now, Today we're going to be discussing Matthew, as I said earlier, Matthew uh, 5, verses 13 through 16. And in these four verses, Yeshua, Jesus, is transitioning from the Beatitudes to a much more detailed explanation and an expansion of the Tanakh. Uh, the Tanakh is what Christians refer to as the Old Testament. It's an acronym of the three parts of the Old Testament, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. In other words, the first five books, that's Torah, known as the Pentateuch, uh, the Nevi'im, which means prophets, and the Ketuvim, which is the writings, which are the minor prophets and the wisdom books. Now, while this lesson can encompass an entire series, I'll be attempting to limit the discussion to revealing pertinent cultural and historical sources of the text and cultural information that I doubt you've ever heard in a Christian church from a Christian pastor or a teacher. Uh, now, as I said, these are historical and cultural source texts, and I'm also going to explain how believers can and should apply this in their daily lives in order to expand the kingdom of God. Excuse me. Now, the outline, outline of the series, there are 21 chapters or 21 parts. Part one we concluded the last time we got together two weeks ago. It's the Beatitudes. Now, what we're going to be working on now is chapter two or part two, Be Salt and Light. Now, we're going to resume. I'm going to take a short vacation uh, from this series, but I'm going to be broadcasting uh, some teachings on uh, the uh, Feast of Dedication, which happens in uh, December. And uh, I'll just be broadcasting them because they're already recorded, but we're not going to be on our regular schedule until the 12th of January. So the, sec the third section is going to be on the 12th, and it's entitled Yeshua, Jesus Did Not Fulfill the Law Yet. Now this is contrary to what most people have heard or been taught. Uh, so you're going to be surprised, and I'm going to support it, with, of course, with, with Scripture. Then we're going to section four is anger management. Five is how to handle lust. Six is marriage and divorce. Section seven is agreements and oaths. I'm going to touch on some of that today. Uh, no, section eight is revenge and retaliation. Uh, nine and ten is love thy neighbor, although nine is love thy neighbor and thine enemies, and ten is love thy neighbors and provide for the needy. Section 11 is how to pray. Twelve is fasting with a purpose. Thirteen is where is your heart. 14, the downfall of anxiety. Anxiety, uh, stress, uh, fear, stress, and anxiety are, um, are warfare in the heavenly places. Uh, 15 is hypocrisy and judgment. 16 is the Lord provides. 17, the proverbial golden rule. 18, the fruit does not fall far from the tree. Section 19, will, 
uh, not all will enter heaven. That's going to be a shocker, and I will support it with three scriptures that say that that's true. Uh, number 20, build a strong foundational faith. And the final and the 21st section is the ultimate authority. Now, as previously discussed, everything, I mean everything that we see Yeshua Jesus teaching, also Paul in scripture, has been previously taught by Yeshua, by Jesus, in his pre-incarnate state. It's been taught to Moses, it's been taught to the prophets, to King David, to King Solomon, and it is, in, and it is recorded in the book I mentioned earlier, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Now, also as previously discussed, the Sermon on the Mount was delivered during the Lord's Feast of Weeks. That's Shavuot in Hebrew. In Greek, it's known as Pentecost. Now, this is one of the three annual pilgrimages found in Deuteronomy 16, and it reads like this. And I said, I'm taking it from the JPS version. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the, the Lord, thy God, in the feast which he shall choose in the Feast of Unleavened Bread and on the Feast of Weeks, and on the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Excuse me a second, I need to clear the screen. Someone's trying to message me. There we go. Okay, so let's look at these four verses between in Matthew uh, 5, verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. Matthew 13 and 14 reads as this, uh, uh, this way. It says, You are the salt of the world, but if the salt should lose its taste... How can it be made salty again? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled on by people. That's very interesting, trampled salt by people. I'll get to that later. Now, you are the, the next verse, verse 14, is you are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot or can't be hidden. Now, verses 15 and 16 of Matthew 5, people don't light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people in such a way that they will see your good actions and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, most versions, King James Version says good works. But I'm using the ISV version, which says actions, and it's more accurate. I'll explain why later. Now, for the purpose of this message, I'm going to break these four verses into two sections. Section one is going to be salt. And section two is going to be light. So let's take a look at verse 13 and see how and why Yeshua Jesus uses the subject of salt. All right, Matthew 5.13, again, I'm going to read it to you. It says, you are the salt of the world, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty again? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled on by people. Now, while Matthew 5.13 appears to use salt for seasoning, in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, God uses it as a metaphor for preservation, flavor, and ruination. Now, he uses it 18 times in the Old Testament in Tanakh to describe the area known as the Dead Sea today. Six times it's used to spoil food and six times to flavor food. And then it's used three other times and it's, and it's used as a covenant or in covenant language. Now, how was salt actually used in ancient times? Well, in ancient times, salt was used for two reasons. Uh, to add flavor and taste to food. And add, it was added to food as a preservative. You see, in ancient times, there was no refrigeration. And in Israel, certainly, <laughs> there was no ice. All right. But God also uses salt as a covenant three times in Tanakh, in the Old Testament. Leviticus 2.3 reads, And every meal offering of thine fault, excuse me, of thine salt, thou shalt season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God, of thy God to be lacking from the meal offering with any, with all thy offerings thou shalt offer salt. I'm going to repeat that again because I stumbled. Okay, it says, And every meal offering of thine, of thine shalt thou season with salt, neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meal offering with all thy offerings. Thou shalt offer salt. Now, we also read about a salt covenant in Numbers 18, 19. And it reads, 
all of the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee and thy sons and thy daughters with thee as a due forever. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord unto thee and to thy seed with thee. I don't know if you ever read it, but let's look at the third uh, scripture in Tanakh in the Old Testament that talks about the covenant of salt. It's in Second Chronicles 3, 13, 5. It reads, Ought ye not to know that the Lord, the God of Israel, gave the kingdom over to Israel, over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? In other words, the entire kingdom of Judah, the entire kingdom given to David, was sealed in a covenant of salt. Now, in order to understand these three verses more accurately, we need to understand two things from a cultural perspective. We need to understand what is a covenant, and we also have to understand what is Midrash. So let's, covenant, let's cover covenants first. A covenant, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, now Merriam-Webster, if you're not familiar with that, is the word authority on the American English language. The old Oxford English Dictionary is the word authority on the British English language. So Merriam-Webster defines a covenant as a solemn and a binding agreement. Now the Oxford, the Oxford English Dictionary defines a covenant simply as an agreement. So therefore, we can all agree, because of the two word authorities on the English language, both British English and English and American English, they say a covenant is an agreement. So can we all agree that there's an agreement? Now when I did this presentation, this message earlier, I had a house full of people and I made sure that they all responded. Of course, as I said, the Radvisari didn't want this to go out earlier, so it's you and me right here. Okay, so scripture contains many different covenants. Some are conditional. Some are unconditional. All are two-sided between the Lord and someone or some group of people. And some are made by one side, God, and may or may not be confirmed by the receiving party. Some were acknowledged by a seal. Others just accepted. Now, the first covenant that we read about in Scripture is the Adamic covenant covenant, and it's found in Genesis 1, verses 26 through 30, and, sorry, I got pause, and Genesis 2, uh, verses 16 and 17. Now, the reason for that is both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 talk about the first man, or first man, human, Adam, or Adam. So, therefore, it's, the covenant is in both uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Now, it's a conditional covenant without a seal. Uh, it's found, I'm, not, I'm just going to read some of the verses. I'm not going to read the entire section. So I'm going to read you the pertinent verses. So we read in Genesis 2, 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. And in verse 17 of Genesis 2, But he says, Of the tree of, knowledge, of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat, it, eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest, Thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, obviously, Adam and Eve did not die uh, physically, but they lost their, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, they, they sinned, and of course, they lost the favor of God at that point. Now, they, in other words, they were no longer immortal. Now, the second covenant in Scripture is the covenant of grace. Now, it's found in these very same verses. You see, this is also a, a conditional covenant without a seal. Um, and, well, let me explain it this way. After Adam and Eve sinned, although they were punished by being sent from the Garden uh, of Eden by God, God still gave them grace. We read it in Genesis 3, 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin, and clothe them. So he still protected them, even though they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. That's grace. Now, the covenant of grace is also found in Ephesians in the New Testament, uh, chapter 2, 
verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now I'm going to be talking about works a little later. I introduced it a little bit earlier. All right, now, the next covenant that we find in Scripture is the Noah is the Noahic, Noahic covenant for Noah. It's found in Genesis 9, verses 9 through 17. It's an unconditional covenant. It's sealed with a rainbow. We read in Genesis 9, 11, And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. In the next, in Genesis 9, 13, we skip a verse. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. So God made a covenant, it's called the Noahic covenant with Noah, but essentially he made a covenant with you and for me. He's never again going to destroy all life on earth with a flood. That doesn't mean he's not going to do it another way. The fourth covenant that we find in Scripture is the Abrahamic covenant. Now, I've broken the Abraham covenant, covenant into part one and into part two. And uh, the reason for that is it actually spans a number of verses in the book of Genesis. It goes all the way through from Genesis 12 through Genesis 17. So it's a long period of time. And of course, God was traveling or with Abraham during this period of time. It starts in, in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. It's an unconditional covenant by God. There is no seal. God says to Abraham, I will, you will, you will be, be greatly multiplied. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. So we don't want to curse, we don't want to curse Abraham. Okay, uh, the fifth covenant in Scripture is called the land covenant, and it's found in Genesis 12, 7 and 8, a little further down, and in Genesis 13, 14 through 17, and it's repeated in Deuteronomy 33. Now, while no seal was required, Abraham did offer one anyway by building an altar to God. We read it in Genesis 12, 8. And uh, let me go a little bit further. And the next covenant in Scripture is Abrahamic Covenant Part 2, also known as the Covenant of Circumcision. But it's an actual, it's a restatement and a reaffirmment of those first two covenants. The covenant of Abrahamic covenant 1 and the covenant of land. Now, it's found in Genesis 17, 1 through 11. As I said, it's, I don't know if I said it, it's an unconditional covenant by God. And it is, of course, sealed by or with a circumcision. That's why it's called, also known as the covenant of circumcision. Now, the next covenant which we find in Scripture is the Sinai Covenant. Now, many people call it the Mosaic Covenant. That's wrong. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. It, the Sinai Covenant is found in Exodus 19, verses 1 through 8. Now, the Sinai Covenant was conditional. We read in Exodus 19, 5, Now, therefore, if ye will hearken unto my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be mine own treasure from among all the peoples, for all of the earth is mine. In verse 6 of Exodus 19, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, Moses then delivered this because God is telling Moses to, to, uh, to explain this verbatim to the people, to the children of Israel. And we read down in 19.8, And all the people answered together and said, <clears throat> All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. So that was a conditional covenant. Now because the Lord, Lord knew that the Israelites would break their oath, the Lord offered a better covenant, which we read about in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34 and beyond. So, and it reads in Jeremiah starting, 31, starting in verse 31, I'll read through 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for as much as they broke my covenant, although I was a Lord over them, saith the Lord. 
But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and in their heart will I write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquities, and their sin will I remember no more. This is the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant. It replaced the Sinai covenant. It was given to Israel, but you, all the Gentiles, have been grafted in by faith through grace, and we read about that in Romans 11, 11 through 17. Now, I suggest, and I really request that you read that in detail because in those few verses you're also given instruction as to why you were brought into the covenant why you were grafted into the olive tree and you should not forsake that responsibility now the mosaic covenant is the next covenant now christian preachers teachers and leaders speak of the mosaic covenant as though it is taboo uh, to everything which is christian they are usually referring to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, known as the Pentateuch in Greek, when it is in fact an extension of and a part of the Sinai Covenant. Now, the next covenant that we read about and find in Scripture is the Davidic Covenant. It's found in 2 Samuel 7, verses 8 through 16. Again, I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to start in verse 8 of 2 Samuel. It says, When thy days are fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, talking to David, that shall proceed out of thy body, and I will establish his kingdom. Now notice, his kingdom, we are talking about a specific person when we use the word his in kingdom. We're talking about the Messiah coming out of the seed of David. In verse 13 we read, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, I don't know about you. I think forever is a very long time. We read in 2 Samuel 7, verses 14 and 15, I will be him for a father, and he shall be to me for a son. If he commit inequity, I will chase, chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took him from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thy house, next verse, and thy kingdom shall be made sure forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So we do know that David was not a perfect man. And we read in the Psalms many, many times that he departed. We read in scripture that he departed. He sinned and God did chasten him as, as, as through the conditions of man, but he always forgave him. And that's what he said he was going to do in this covenant, in the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7. This is an unconditional covenant continuing the first messianic prophecy, which we read in Genesis 3.15. And I covered it two weeks ago. Uh, in the Beatitudes 8 and 9. And it basically, it said to the serpent, it said, I will put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. And you will bruise his heel and he will crush your head. Now, that's not what it says in English, but you have to read it in Hebrew in order to understand the inflections and the severity of that warning, that prophecy. Now the Davidic, the Davidic, excuse me, the Davidic covenant is also found in the book of Luke. Now I'm using for this version, uh, for this purpose, I'm using the TLV, today's Living Version, and we read in Luke 1:30, the angel spoke to her, "Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God." Continuing in Luke 1:31. Behold, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua. See, Jesus, the name Jesus didn't appear until the J and the U was added into the English language. Hebrew didn't have a J sound, Greek didn't have a J, and Latin didn't have a J. It had an I or an I 
I. Or so the name Jesus actually is about 450 years old, and it only came into being because it was, I guess, easier to pronounce once the J was added into the English language. So don't worry about what you call God. God knows your heart. So regardless, as long as you're calling him Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh, Yehovah, God knows, God knows, Adonai, God knows your heart. All right, so at any rate, we continue in Luke 1, verses 32 and 33. He will be great and will be called Ben Elyon, son of the Most High, Adonai Elohim, the Lord. So it's son of the Mo God, uh, God Most High, the Lord. And the Lord will give him a throne of David, his father. He shall reign over the house of Jacob for all eternity, and his kingdom will be without end. And can I get a big amen for that? Amen. All right. So now that we have looked at the covenants, let's address the second part that I wanted to uh, that I mentioned earlier, and that is midrash. Chances are you've never heard of midrash unless you've listened to some of my previous messages. Midrash is a form of ancient Hebrew literature used to interpret scripture. You have to understand, as I as I said earlier, first of all, all the scripture and the only scripture that existed during Jesus, during Yeshua's ministry while he was on the earth, is the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. That's all there was. That was scripture. And now nowadays we call all the Bible scripture, but back then that's all there was. So Midrash is the ancient Hebrew literature which I got had to pause, which actually interprets uh, the scripture. We're talking about it interprets the Old Testament scripture. And while it was formally introduced as a form of literature in the early 2nd century AD, it existed without a name much, much earlier than that. As I have discussed in other messages, Hebrew has many different levels, understanding and numerous meanings for the Hebrew words, for Hebrew letters, including numbers. I actually have a teaching that I don't believe I've made a, uh, made a broadcast on. That's called the 40 layers of Hebrew. And I go into a great detail on that. However, because the Tanakh, the Old Testament, was, was taught through memorization before books in ancient times, I mean, the printing press wasn't invented until the 1500s, the Hebrew words which were selected and used by the scribes had to rhyme. So metaphor and allegory was used for ease of memorization, learning, and understanding. Now, if you haven't paid attention or haven't watched my video where I talk about education or educating young Jewish boys in ancient times, memorization, the memorization process started at the age of five, and it was put to rhyme or song or music, very much like kids today can memorize dozens, maybe even hundreds of songs uh, lyrics and tunes, well, that's how the Torah, that's how the Tanakh, that's how the Old Testament was taught in ancient times. Hi, Kimmy. Well, at any rate, so metaphor and, and, and uh, allegory was used, and in order, for it to, in order for it to rhyme, you didn't necessarily use specific words, but you used metaphoric words. This is why Yeshua Jesus uses parables. Parables, allegory, assisted a metaphor, to deliver his messages for the salvation of humanity because it wasn't a new practice to the people that were listening to him. They were aware of it in ancient Israel because most of them were men and they'd already been studying and memorizing scripture for decades. Now, if we look at Leviticus 12, uh, 2.13, Numbers 18.19, and Chronicles 13.15 more closely, we see an example of how the metaphoric... Uh, words are used. Let me read again Leviticus 2.13. And every meal offering of thine shalt thou, shalt thou season with salt, neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking for thy meal offering, which all thy offerings thou shalt offer, excuse me, with all thy offerings thou shalt offer salt. So the question is, is it flavor? Is it preservative? Or is it an agreement? The answer is, it's all of the above. You see, in this verse, we see flavor, we see preservation, 
we see the preservation of God's covenant, and we also will not suffer the flavor of God's withdrawing his covenant from us. Plus, in our offerings, we must provide flavor or sincerity in our offerings. In Numbers 18, 19, all of the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer unto the Lord have I given thee and thy sons and thy daughters with thee as a due forever. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord unto thee and unto thy seed with thee. Now, Numbers 18.19 depicts a two-way agreement of sincerity in our relationship with God and his sincerity with the Israelites either directly descended from or grafted into the olive tree. This relationship is eternal, whether the original olive tree or the grafted in. Now in Numbers 18, 19, the Lord uses three terms. Well, actually, one term and two words. Having the same connotation. Do forever. Everlasting and salt, they all mean the same thing. He uses all three of these to make his point. And if you know anything about Hebrew, when you repeat something, even if you use a different metaphoric word, it emphasizes or adds a, an exclamation point to whatever the Lord is telling us. Now in Second Chronicles 13.5, we read, Ought ye not to know that the Lord, the God of Israel, gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt. So he, he, he pledged a covenant of salt when he gave it to David. A covenant of salt is meaning an agreement preserved forever. And 2 Chronicles 13.5 refers to Jacob's prophecy and blessing concerning the seed of Judah and the coming Messiah that we read about in Genesis 49.10. It says, and it reads, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, as long as men come to Shiloh, and unto him shall the obedience of the peoples be. Now, Christianity, people have been talking about what Shiloh is because if you look at the concordances, there is no definition for Shiloh. Well, actually there is. It just means until he comes. Amazing, isn't it? Well, in Second Chronicles 13, 5, it is telling us that this is, this is the eternal relationship. The covenant of salt means that God will preserve his relationship with the seed of David for eternity. If we look at the Hebrew compared to the Greek, we see a metaphoric meaning in Matthew 5.13. You see, the Greek word used for salt is halos, which metaphorically means prudence. Now, specifically, it, def definitively, it means salt, but metaphorically, it means prudence. And remember, we use metaphor to learn, memorize scripture in ancient times. The Greek word for savor is moraino, metaphorically meaning to become passive or foolish. Now, if we use midrash, in other words, ancient Hebrew literature, a form of literature, to examine the first part of Leviticus 2.13, we read, And every meal offering of thine shalt thou season with salt. We find that the Hebrew word used for both season and salt has the same root word, and that root word is melech. Not melech, which is king. Melech. Now, using midrash to, uh, and turning to the Septuagint, let me explain to you why I'm using the Septuagint. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Every, all the only scripture that existed in his time was the Old Testament, the Tanakh. But he was dealing with people who only understood Greek. They didn't speak Hebrew even though he was a Pharisee and was fluent in Hebrew. So what he did is he used the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament. It goes by, it's known by three names. It's known as the Septuagint. 
It's known as the LXX, and it's also known as the Greek Old Testament. And it uses the same word that Matthew 5, 13 uses. It uses helas, which again metaphorically means prudence. Now, looking at Matthew 5, 13 from the ISV this way, we now substitute in these words or definitions metaphorically for salt. And it reads, you are the judiciousness of the world, but if your discretion, if your discretion should become foolish, how can it be made wise or sensible again? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled on by people. I'm going to read that again. Metaphorically, we use the metaphors instead of the word salt. You are the judiciousness of the world, but if the discretion should become foolish, how can it be made wise or sensible again? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled on the people. So this is what we are reading in metaphorically in Matthew 5.13. We are the salt of the earth. Okay, the covenant of salt is God's unwavering promise that the Messiah, the Savior, the, the Savior in Greek, the Christ will, or in this case, has come from the seed of David and will come back from the seed of David. The message of Matthew 5.13 is that his return can be inhibited by us as it is our responsibility to take the message of salvation, the gospel, to the world. That's Matthew 28, 18 through 20, known as the Great Commission. Now, let's look at the second part of that message. What, let's look at the word light from Matthew, 14, Matthew 5, 14 and 16. Let's break Matthew 5, 13 and 14 into two parts. The first part, you are the light to the world. And the second part, a city located on a hill cannot be hidden. Now the source text for this scripture, it, you are the light of the world, is Proverbs 4, 18 and 19. Now I'm going to read it to you. But if the path of righteousness is as the light of dawn, the that shineth more and more unto the perfect day, the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not what they stumble. In order to understand this a little better, let's look at Genesis 1. We read in Genesis 1, verses 2 through 4, Now the earth was unformed and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Now, what we think about is, uh, in our own culture and in present time, we think of night and day. But there's more to it. Why is God separating the light from the darkness? Okay, the key phrase is in Genesis 1-4. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So again, why does he say light is good and then separate it from the darkness? If you're going to use Midrash, you're going to juxtapose one phrase or one thought from another. But yet he doesn't tell you what the darkness is. Is the darkness the opposite of good? Obviously, the way it's written it is. So the answer definitely is yes, and Bible translators juxtapose the English words light and darkness as though they are opposites. So why is that? The Hebrew word for light is or, meaning to illuminate, while the Hebrew word for darkness is koshek, but koshek means evil, but it doesn't say that in English. It just says darkness. Just as Chaucer and William Shakespeare used allegory and metaphor, the translators of the King James Bible also used metaphor for some words as it was more palatable to the ears of the people or the listeners or the watchers of their time. 
Yeshua Jesus explains this in John 3.19. He writes, And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were, get this last word, evil. In John 18.12b we read, I am the light of the world, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Are you following Yeshua, Jesus? Are you in the light? See, as we read further in the Gospel of John, John 9, 5, Yeshua tells us, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Because he's not in the world. Sorry, got another interruption. And we read in John 12, 46, he tells us, I come a light into the world that whoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. In other words, should not ad abide in evil. Let's take a look at the second half of Matthew 5.14 now. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. This is a metaphor for Jerusalem, God's holy city, or God's city on a hill. While the holy mountain or the holy hill appears seven times in Scripture, in the King James ver Version it uses hill, in the ISV it uses uh, mountain. Seven times it appears in Scripture. I, I recommend and I encourage you to go to my YouTube channel, Rose of Sharon, comma, MN. Just go to youtube.com, Rose of Sharon, MN. Or you can go to my, my Facebook page for Rose of Sharon Ministries, MN and watch and listen to the two teachings I have on Jerusalem and Prophecy, Part 1 and Part 2. I go into a lot of detail of the names of, of Jerusalem. God's holy hill first appears in Scripture in Psalm 2.6. It says, Truly, it is I that have established my king upon Zion, upon Zion and my holy mountain. The JPS version uses mountain instead of hill, as Jerusalem sits at the top of Mount Zion, or Mount Zion. Now, there are other practical reasons for the verse, for that this particular verse, the city on the hill is can't be hidden. Practical. You see, while the statement is common sense, culturally castles of the, of the ancient kings were always built on a hill for two reasons. One, it was easier to defend, to defend against attacks, and every spring, the, we read in Scripture, the kings went out to war. Well, the ones that were being warred against, they had to be on a hill so they could see the attacks coming. It was just uh, a defense mechanism. But the other reason is that the monarch can now overlook his entire kingdom. And if you've been to Jerusalem, which is on a few more mountains than it used to be in, in King David's time, uh, you can look over the entire ancient kingdom there. And then so. So, allegorically, Yeshua, Jesus, is telling his disciples that they were kings and priests among the nations. We read in Revelation 1, 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto the God and his Father, to him his glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We read in Revelation 5, 8 through 10, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden veils full of odors, in other words, that's fragrances, uh, which are the prayers of the saints. In Revelation 5, 9, excuse me, 5, 9 and 10, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of the out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto God kings and priests and we shall reign on earth amen so let's look at the last two verses of this message Matthew 15:515 people don't light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Well, in ancient times, houses were lit by oil lamps. Some had candles, but mostly it was oil lamps. Metaphorically, Yeshua, Jesus is telling his bride, 
that's us, to keep our lamps lit. For no one but the Father knows the time of his return. I suggest you see the parable of the ten virgins from Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. And also my message on understanding the times, the imminent return of Jesus. How do we prepare chapter 12? It's also, I don't know if I've got that one on YouTube. I don't think I have that one on YouTube. It's way down in my my uh, timeline because I haven't taught that for a while. But I suggest you read the, you look at those for more details. And if you uh, want to look at uh, how the wedding, how the uh, Bible is is structured, I have a teaching on the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony, which is actually on YouTube, and also on the feast of uh, Tabernacles, which I just did. Uh, although I don't go into the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony as much detail, uh, and talking about the uh, parable of the uh, uh, the parable of uh, the parable from uh, what did I say? What verse? Oh, that's right. Uh, well, as we look at the final verse in Matthew five sixteen, uh, keep in mind that we are now, as believers, in the risen Messiah, and we now carry that light to the world. Matthew five sixteen reads in the same way: Let your light shine before people in such a way that they will see your good actions and glorify your Father in heaven. Now the King James says good works. But the whole purpose is our outward persona is supposed to be glorifying our Father in heaven. Most Bible versions use the phrase good works as opposed to good actions like in the ISV, which is used in the International Standard Version, as I just said. Now using good works appears to set up a dichotomy between Jesus and Paul's words. It really does. You see, Paul and Romans, after the exile of the Jews, returned to the Church of Rome in an attempt to reconcile the Gentiles, or with the Gentiles, who remained during the Jewish exile and whom were brought into the kingdom through the covenant of grace, through God's grace, with those of the original olive tree. And he writes in Romans 11:6, And if thy grace, if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it is by works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. So he's he's looking at the, he's talking about the two sides between the Jews who believe in in works and the uh, the Romans who believe in because it came in in grace. We also read in 2 Timothy 1.9, Paul uses works which is perceived to be negatively. He says, Who hath saved us and called us with his holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which has given us in Christ Jesus before the Lord began. You see, these statements all too often are used by Christian teachers to insinuate that work is bad. But even Yeshua Jesus used the word works, or at least translated into English. We read in John 5.36. But if I have greater witness than that of John, for, he's referring to John the Baptist, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. We also read in John 10.25, I told you, and ye believe not the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So works is not bad. This is how we share our faith with people whom we come in contact with. We share our God stories and our outward persona, our, our, our deeds. That tells us that tells them that we're different than the average bear, the average person. Uh, that was a yogi bear uh, uh, analogy. We're different than most people. For this reason, I have chosen to use, as I said earlier, the International Standard Version of the Bible because it doesn't use the word works. It uses the word actions. It is our outward actions which separate us from the world. Now, it separates us from the darkness, the koshek, from the evil of the world. 
while we battle daily against the influence of this evil. We find it in Ephesians 6.12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places or in heavenly places, some versions say. In other words, we're, doing, we're dealing with powers and principalities in heavenly places. In other words, we're dealing with the fallen angels, the Nephal, that plagued the earth, and, why, and that's why God brought the flood in Noah's time. They're still here in heavenly places, and they're influencing some of them. Some of them are actually kept in a pit. We read in Ephesians 6.14, uh, it says, Therefore stand, having your loins girded about the, with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness. Continuing in verse 15, and put, your, and, and put your feet sod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, continuing above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. In verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. That's right, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. You need to be in the word. In verse 18 it says, Praying always, with prayer and supplication in the thruach, in the ruach, in the spirit, and watching a four and two with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. This concludes chapter two to be salt and light in the world. Now we'll be taking a short break from live broadcasts, although I do plan on on re posting a couple of uh, teachings that I have on the Feast of Dedication over the next month and a half. But we'll be taking a short break from live broadcast, and we will be returning on January 12th at roughly about 7.30 Central Standard Time. That's 12.30 Sunday morning, Janet Greenwich Mean Time. And we'll pick up in Chapter 3, Part 10 of this series, and the title is going to be Jesus Did Not Abolish the Law Yet. It's going to shock some people, but... That's something that is often left out of Christian church teaching. Before signing off, I want to leave you with the Aaronic blessing from Numbers 6, verses 24, 25, and 26. And I'm going to recite it in Hebrew. Just as I'm going to put it to rhyme, because all of Scripture is in rhyme. Yevarechach Adonai Vayishmarecha Ye'er Adonai Pana Velecha Vehunecha Ye'er Adonai Pana Velecha V'yasem Lecha Shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his peace. Amen. Until we see you again, I encourage you to watch my reposted teachings on the Feast of Dedication over the next several weeks. It's also already on my YouTube channel and on my Rosa Sharon Ministries MN Facebook page, a separate page than this page. And we'll see you with, a, uh, with the continuation of this expository se uh, series on January 12th next year. Lahit Reot, until next time. Laila Tov, good night and goodbye.